It has been good to be here today, and I have enjoyed already the meeting of people that I have known years before. And I look forward to all of the services that have been scheduled with the finest anticipation. And whatever your own expectations are regarding these services, they do not exceed my own. The time for these sermons is a little more limited than my sermons usually, at least a part of the time, are. But I'm going to do the best I can to conform to the schedule because these sermons are really designed for a special purpose, and I'm conscious of that fact, and I want to cooperate in every way I can. Sometimes when I preach, it reminds people more of a filibuster in the Senate by the Southerners than it does a gospel service, but we'll not be having the filibusters in this meeting. And as our lesson this morning was on the Church of Christ, its principles and its pleas. Our lesson tonight is The Church Lost and Found. My text is in the sixth chapter of Jeremiah, verse 16, which I now read, Stand ye in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. That is one of the dramatic passages of the Old Testament and is a climax of an appeal from the prophet Jeremiah that started in the first verse or the first chapter of his prophecy. It really represents the story of mankind in the course of history, religious history, the history of mankind even in a religious way, not only in his relations with God, in a natural way, in the governments of the world, but in his religious rebellion to God, to God's word and God's ways. We have, in the course of the history of mankind, development from Eden to Babel, and then from the time of Jeremiah through the history of the nation of Israel, and then as a counterpart of all of those things, conditions that would prevail among us in the world today. We get lessons from the Jewish experiences of the Old Testament. Many of them are typical, and the history of the church from New Testament times until now. In the third chapter of Genesis, we have the beginning of man's history in this world, the creation of man. In the sixth chapter of Genesis, we have the story of a universal apostasy that occurred. And in the eleventh chapter of Genesis, we have a record of a second universal apostasy that was threatened in the Tower of Babel and the city of Babel. When man first broke through the restrictions of divine law and was thereby separated from God, God placed in the Garden of Eden a flaming sword, which was a symbol of divine justice. But beside that flaming sword were the cherubim, and that was the symbol of grace and mercy. It meant that while man had separated himself from God and had been expelled from his Edenic home because of sin, it was not without remedy. The unfolding scheme of human redemption began there. The bloodstream of the Old Testament started its flow from the altars that were erected, and uh, they were not broken. They continued in an unbroken flow, so to speak, until merged with the crimson flood of the blood of Jesus Christ, 
from the cross of Calvary. That is the very beginning of God's dealings with man. And we have the story of transgression in Eden. In the sixth chapter of Genesis, we have universal rebellion against God. And it was necessary for God to purge the world of its wickedness and start the race anew. Then in the eleventh chapter of Genesis, we have the story of a second threat of universal apostasy when men, again in rebellion against God, attempted to throw off the government of God and the religion of God and establish their own. And they devised a tower, which is called the Tower of Babel, which the record says they intended that it should reach to heaven. I don't think even men in that day would be foolish enough to believe that they could build a tower that would actually reach to heaven. And so that must have been a hyperbole. That is, they meant to build the highest tower that had ever been known. I suppose we could call it the first skyscraper. And it was for the purpose of symbolizing the strength of their own human government in rebellion against God. Immediately thereafter, God called Abraham. Having broken up the designs of those men by confusion of tongues, then God found it necessary to establish a medium or a channel through which he could operate. And in the twelfth chapter of Genesis, the record says God had said to Abraham. The twelfth chapter of Genesis is not the occasion of the call of Abraham uses past tense. It said God had called Abraham. So the call of Abraham was a sequel to the episode of the 11th chapter of Genesis when God found it necessary to establish a medium through which he could operate. He couldn't use the whole race of man because of apostasy to unfold the scheme of human redemption. So he established a special medium. And out of the loins of Abraham, he formed a special race. And out of that special race, he organized a special nation, the nation of Israel. And the purpose of that nation was to furnish God a medium of operation through which he could bring into being the scheme of human redemption to bring man back to God. And that was the whole purpose of the nation of Israel. And when the time came for Israel to be terminated because that purpose had been fulfilled, and they went out of existence. But during the course of the history of the nation of Israel, their whole history is filled with apostasy, with rebellion against God, and with disobedience to him. And so in the text that we have from Jeremiah 6, 16 tonight, Stand ye in the ways and see, ask for the old paths, where is the good way? It simply represents the appeal of the nation of Israel against their backsliding. And in the 11th chapter of Hosea, verse 7, added to those appeals of Jeremiah, the prophet Hosea said that Israel was bent to backsliding. They were bent to backsliding. And we have a statement in the second chapter of Jeremiah here in regard to Israel's backsliding. In chapter 2 and verse 19, Thine own wickedness shall co correct thee. And thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. When it said here that Israel's wickedness would correct them, that simply means that when the course of people become actually so wicked, it will result in a self-correction in national affairs. That is sometimes true in social affairs, that things can reach only a certain point, and they become self-rebuked and thus self-corrected. And that was the situation that existed in the nation of Israel. And it says, It is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord. Now that's in direct connection with Jeremiah's plea. In the first chapter of Jeremiah, the Lord called this young prophet to the stern prophetic task 
of correcting the deviations and departures of Israel. And God said, I have put my words in your mouth. You shall speak the things that I command you to speak. Jeremiah said, I cannot speak, Lord, for I'm a child. He meant, of course, a child in comparison with the gigantic task that had been placed upon him, that he was not equal to it. But God said, Be not afraid. I have put my words in your mouth, and you shall speak the things that I command you to speak. God said, I have set thee over the nations to root out, to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy, to plant, and to build. That was a drastic task for a young man of such tender emotions. And God had selected this young man of tenderness to perform the sternest task assigned to any prophet in the Old Testament. We sometimes wonder why. Jeremiah was called a weeping prophet because he wept over the conditions prevailing in the nation of Israel. And as a young man, he lived to see the finest system of national religion that the world ever knew totter to its fall. He saw the altars of God collapse. He saw the fires die out from beneath them. But he gathered the live coals from the altars into his bosom to carry the fiery message of God. Root out, pluck up, pull down, destroy, plant, and build. We have six terms there, four of which represent negative work. Root out and pluck up, agricultural, then plant. Pull down, destroy, has to do with construction, then build. You wouldn't expect a construction company to start building without excavation. You wouldn't expect a farmer to start planting without rooting out and plucking up. Well, that's the process of dealing with error and getting the heart ready to receive the truth. One sophisticated sister stepped up to me one time after one of my sermons and said, Brother Wallace, I think you ought to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. Quoting from that song, I thought if she could quote, so could I. And I said, Sister, don't fence me in. And so, you know, we have the negative and we have the positive. And the positive just simply means the affirmative. And here we have the ruling out and the plugging up and the pulling down and the destroying and then the planting and the building. And God assigned that task, and it was quite a task, a wonderful task, to Jeremiah the prophet. And he said, Be not afraid. A preacher who is afraid to preach has no place in God's plan. A prophet of God in the Old Testament that wouldn't prophesy the word of God, God said he couldn't use him. An apostle of Christ in the New Testament that would not under all circumstances stand up for the word of Christ that had been placed in them, of course, would have been another Judas among the apostles of Christ. And so that's the plan that we have in this verse here, verse 16 of Jeremiah 6, Stand in the ways and see, ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. But they said, We will not walk therein. That was the spirit of rebellion. And we have to warn against that now. But you'll notice that this verse says, Stand. Stand in the ways and see. Ask. Ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? Well, stand would mean stop. Ask would mean to inquire. See would mean to look. Stand in the ways and see, that means stop and look. Ask, that means listen. Stop, look and listen. Walk, that means the action that you take when your choice has been made. So actually the emphasis that we find in this verse is simply that one way is right. Only one way to be right. And that one way to be right is to walk in the way that is right. And there isn't any other way to be right. There are many ways to be wrong, but there's only one way to be right, is the emphasis that we find in that passage and in that verse. And then we have the word ways first and the word way second. There's an S on the first word, stand in the ways. 
That means many ways. He's not talking about a literal road except for an illustration. Stand in the ways and see. That's when you come to the forks in the roads. Then ask for the good way. Not any S on that one. Many ways, but just one good one. Many ways, but just one right way. And it's the responsibility of every person in interest of his own soul to ask for the good way to find it and to walk in it. And if he doesn't ask for it, if he doesn't seek for it, if he doesn't inquire for it, then he becomes the enemy of his own soul because his salvation depends on walking in the right way. And finding the right way depends on seeking it. We must seek it in order to find it. But just as surely as we seek it, we shall find it. And having find, found it, why, well, then it's our obligation to walk in it, to continue in it. We don't stop at it. And we don't stop when we enter it. We walk on and on in it. And that is the procedure of being right. But we have, furthermore, the emphasis placed on man's way and God's way in the statement, we will not walk therein. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, if I may turn to it and read a few of its lines here, the apostle emphasizes the difference between God's way and man's way. And God said that his thoughts are higher and greater than man's thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. That simply makes it foolish for a man to elevate himself against God. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways than your ways. That emphasizes, then, the difference between God and man. There are some things here that need a little more emphasis. First of all is God teaches man his way. God teaches man his way. Hosea the prophet said, The ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them. Second, God forbids man's way. Jeremiah the prophet said, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his step. God teaches man his way. God forbids man's way, then God curses perversion. Turn to Galatians, the first chapter, beginning with verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removing from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto a different gospel, which is not another. Only there be some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. When he said, a different gospel, which is not another, he simply meant, after all, this different gospel is just not a gospel. They had turned to a different gospel, removed from the grace of Christ, unto a different gospel which is not another. In fact, no gospel at all, and he tells us why. <coughs> Only there be some who would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, a perverted gospel ceases to be the gospel, is Paul's emphasis there. Perversion means an improper mixture. You don't have to take anything out of a loaf of bread to pervert it. Just put the wrong thing in it. Bread is God's power, for instance, through the natural law to quell the hunger and to sustain the physical man. But you can destroy that power without removing anything from it. Just the improper mixture. Put a tablespoonful of arsenic in a loaf of bread. And it destroys the power and the purpose that nature gives to it. And then you can take a glass of water, which is nature's power to quench the thirst. But you put a handful of salt in it, and you've destroyed that power to quench. 
put poison in the bread and you destroyed that power to quell the hunger and to sustain the body. Well, let men bring into the gospel their human traditions and their doctrinal errors, and it destroys the saving power because the improper admixture is a perversion. And that's what perversion means. And in Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter and the 36th verse, why God, through Jeremiah, accused the prophets of Israel of perverting the words of the living God. Uses that expression. Perverting the words of the living God. And God said that he would punish that man with all his house. Now, that's a very forceful statement, that the prophet that perverted the words of the living God. Emphasis on that. When we stand in the presence of God, we stand in awe. And when we stand in the presence of the Word of God, we stand in the same awe. Because when we stand in the presence of God's Word, it's called the Word of the living God. And when men alter that Word, they pervert it. You can't alter it and change it without coming under the condemnation that we have right here. We're living in a particular time when men, under the guise of what they call new translations, have exercised the liberty to put into their own words what they believe to be the meaning of the words and the phrases and the sentences of the Bible. That represents perversion. God said, I will punish that man. Any man who does that comes under that warning. I will punish that man. I wouldn't stand in their shoes in the judgment day for 10,000 worlds like this. The Word of God cannot be used in the reckless manner in which men are using it, even under the guise of late and modern translations. And so that brings us to another part of our lesson and right up to the point of our subject, the church lost and found. I've only tried to trace the story of mankind in the course of human history and divine religion, both Jewish and now up to the point of uh, Christianity itself, and hence both Jewish and Christian, that we have the same tendencies in every generation of man to depart from God, to reject his word, and to walk in his own ways. I've used these Old Testament illustrations only to approach our lesson tonight on the church lost and found. That brings us to examine some periods of church history. And we'd start with the word perfection, and then the word departure, and then the word uh, apostasy, and then the word reformation, and then the word restoration. All of that belongs to the course of religious history from New Testament times right down to our time. We use the history of the Jewish church or the Jewish nation only to illustrate the history that we have in reference to Christianity, which of course originated so far as its establishment is concerned in the New Testament. I believe that Christianity was in the Old Testament in type and in prophecy. I believe that the Old and the New Testaments represent together the continuity of divine revelation. That we're not under the Old Testament, but that doesn't mean we don't believe it. Sometimes when we try to show people that we're not under the Old Testament, why well, they'll say, you just don't believe the Old Testament. One man told me that. He said, you don't believe the Old Testament. I said, do you believe it? And he said he did. I said, do you believe that the Old Testament has been taken out of the way? And he said, no, I don't. I said, then you don't believe the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is the book that said that about itself, in that it saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, and Paul quoted it in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, and showed that what the Old Testament said in advance about itself had been done. And that was a quotation from the Old Testament. And so if you don't believe that the Old Testament has been taken away, then you are the one who doesn't believe the Old Testament. I believe it. We're not under it. That doesn't mean it isn't true at all. 
And it isn't called the Old Testament. It wasn't called the Old Testament as long as it was in force. There isn't a law in the statute books of the state of Tennessee that you'd call an old law. While it's in operation, you wouldn't call it that. But when it's repealed, when it's abrogated, when it's relegated, it becomes no law. Then why is the Old Testament old? Not because it was written first. Not because it's older than the New Testament. It is old, Paul said in Hebrews 8, 13, because God made it old. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. He made it old by abrogating it, taking it out of the way. And so the continuity of divine revelation is maintained all right. The Old Testament is true, and the revelation of God was in it, and the history of God's people Israel is recorded there, and the history of mankind in its relation to the divine plan of human redemption, we have all of that in the Old Testament. It makes the Bible the longest thread of thought ever woven in the loom of time. And there's no repudiation of the Old Testament because we recognize the difference in the dispensations under which men have lived and have served God. And so we use those things only to illustrate the principles that have to do with the history of the church. We have to start with that first word, perfection. Now, God has done everything in perfection. When he created man, he made him exactly like he wanted him to be. Adam was God's model. He was the perfect man. There was not a cloud over his path. There was not a jar in his whole nature. There was no experience of pain and no dread of evil. He could look up into the face of his God, his creator and his maker, with love them and confidence on poison, with which a child may look into the face of his mother. But in the process of time, man being a free moral agent, he broke through the restrictions of divine law and became separated from God. Sometimes people say, why didn't God create a man incapable of sinning? If he wouldn't have been a man. God would have created a machine instead of a man. He endowed him with the power of will and intellect, and God doesn't circumvent the faculty of his creature in any of the relationships that we sustain to God. God operates upon the mind of man only through his mind, through his intellect, isn't direct. And the New Testament refers to the law of the mind, and that's only a, ne a designation for the law of God. God's law is addressed to the mind, and therefore God's law is called the law of the mind. You wouldn't preach the gospel to a goat because the goat doesn't have a mind. The, the gospel is the law of the mind, addressed to the mind, addressed to the intellect, and therefore designated God's law in that phrase, the law of the mind. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate on anyone except through God's law of the mind, addressed to the intellect. It enters the mind that way. Paul said, Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. We receive the Holy Spirit through the hearing of faith, and the Holy Spirit remains in us the same way that it gets in us. If it enters us through the hearing of faith, then why can't it stay in us through the hearing of faith? There isn't any mystical, mystified, uh, direct, intangible, unintelligible, better felt than told way of God influencing man. But rather than get away from that illustration of the perfect man, that God made Adam exactly like he wanted him to be. But Adam transgressed, degeneration took place, and we have centuries <coughs> of degeneration from the first man until now. But we can span all of those centuries of degeneration, and we can see the model, the first man as God made him, as God created him. And it ought to be our aim to reattain the perfection that God imparted to the first man that he made as his model. <clears throat> well, in the second chapter of Ephesians, verses 14 to 16, <clears throat> the apostle tells us that God created a new man. And that new man that God created is called the church, right there in that same context. 
So the church is the one new man. It's a new creation. We have the old creation and we have the new creation. And the church is that new creation and is called the one new man. And God made it perfect. The New Testament church was perfect. That doesn't mean its members were perfect. But God gave us a perfect institution. He made the church through and in Jesus Christ exactly like he wanted it to be, just like he made Adam. But just as in the case of Adam, breaking through the restrictions of divine law, separation came and degeneration came, departure came, even in New Testament times. So we have the word perfection. That's the creation. The Spirit saith expressly that in the last days men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of demons or devils. The last days means the gospel dispensation. That passage doesn't refer to the approaching end of time. Isaiah the prophet tells us in the second chapter, in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house would be established, and that the law of the Lord would go out of Zion, and the word of God from Jerusalem. And Jesus referred to it himself in Luke 24 and pointed to Pentecost as the fulfillment of it. The last days began on Pentecost. In Hebrews 1, Paul says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in the last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's the gospel aid, the gospel dispensation, the last days. And when Paul said to Timothy, the Spirit saith expressly, that in the last days men shall depart from the faith, give heed to seducing spirits, that means that even though the Holy Spirit had given to them divine revelation, that all along, during the Holy Spirit dispensation, man would give heed to seducing spirits instead of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly the line between truth and error, the Holy Spirit and seducing spirits. And that's what departure means, when man give heed to seducing spirits instead of the word that the Holy Spirit has given to us. And that is departure, and that departure came right in the apostolic day and time. And it continued. Well, then it developed in what we would call apostasy, because apostasy is a stronger word than departure, and is the result of a continued or a continuous departure until it culminates in apostasy itself. Well, departure started in uh, a gradual way. It didn't come about overnight. And I'd say that it started first in the corruption of the divine arrangement of the New Testament church. In our lesson this morning, we mentioned that that divine arrangement is simply that of the congregation, elders, deacons, members, and that there was a plurality of elders in each church. But as time went on, they had one elder over several churches. Instead of a, a plurality of elders in one church, there was a plurality of churches under one elder. And then a presiding elder, an elder over the elders. And then the bishop and the archbishop, which simply meant a diocesan bishop over a diocese of bishops. Then it was an easy step, you see, up to the papal system and the pope on his throne. Because after all, the pope was just an overgrown metropolitan bishop. And that was the gradual departure that we had in the history of things, beginning even in the New Testament. Next, departure centered and was focused on uh, what we would call a doctrinal question. That was an organizational question. But, for instance, the very first case of sprinkling that we have in all history was that of Novation, who was sick and being very ill. They substituted sprinkling for immersion and sprinkled water over his bed not just on a spot, over his bed. When Novation recovered, they insisted that he should be immersed. And he said, if sprinkling is baptism when one is sick, then it's baptism when one is well, because the condition of a person's health has nothing to do with what baptism is. And he claimed that it would be mockery if he should be immersed. Later, he became a candidate for the Bishop of Rome, and only immersed persons could qualify. And he was asked to be immersed to qualify for his candidacy, and refused.
and forfeited that position rather than do what he called making a mark of baptism. And in the 10th century, it was made a sacrament. And so there is departure in a doctrinal matter. And uh, that occurred 252 A.D. Then came corruption in the realm of worship, or departure in the realm of worship. When in uh, 670 A.D., the first instrument of music ever introduced into any body of people claiming to be Christians, was introduced by Pope Vitalian I, and when it threatened to split the Roman Church, why, it was removed. And in 800, 130 years later, it was reintroduced in that time it stayed. But every reformer, and the voice of every reformer, coming out of Romanism, was lifted up against the corruptions, even in the case of the use of mechanical instrumentation in worship. There we hear the voices of Luther and Wesley and Calvin, but it illustrates only how that departures came, and it was gradually. And so we had it in organization and in doctrine and in worship. And then we have a complete condition of apostasy, as history would relate it, between the sixth century and the 16th century, 1,000 years of apostasy. From the 11th to the 16th century is that particular period of history that's called the Dark Ages, when the Bible was taken away from the people, when they were taught that they couldn't understand it and couldn't interpret it, that it had to be interpreted for them. And thus a medium was erected between people and the Bible. And uh, one young man who entered a German institution to prepare himself for the duties of a priest, came across an old rusty Bible and read it as he could. And in reading that old Bible, he found that the institution to which he had attached himself had departed completely from its teaching. He severed his connection from that monastery and went out preaching reform. He didn't intend to leave or to quit what was then called the church. He wanted to reform it. But every reformation has failed. There never has been a successful reformation in all the history of the world. Because when men have undertaken reformations, the result of their effort has always been the emergence of uh, denominationalism of some other sort, or of some other kind. And history will support that statement. So the efforts of Luther and Wesley and Calvin and Zwingli, whose names are familiar to all students of history, only resulted in the formation of Protestant denominationalism. We do not go into the definite organization and names of those things here, but that is the way that uh, Protestant denominationalism came into being right out of a state of dismal darkness and apostasy, because there were some men who were devoted. They were steeped in errors, but in their heart they were devoted. I admire Luther as he stands before the Diet of Worms and said, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. His aims were right. He was headed in the right direction. So were these other men. But they had to crawl before they could walk. And coming out of centuries of darkness, you couldn't expect them to reattain and restore the whole truth, even in the period of their lives at that particular time. But they certainly made the start in the right direction. And I believe that we today derive fruits from the work of those men who were called reformers, even though their work did degenerate into Protestant denominationalism, and they failed to arrive at the goal that they had set before them and their own worthy aim. Nevertheless, they made the start, and out of that start came the fruition of their own desires and later efforts of later men. And so that defines 
a period of perfection and a period of departure and a period of reformation. And that brings us to the fourth word, and that is the word restoration. And right out of the ranks of these very men who had carried on the work of reformation came the plea for restoration. It didn't come from an outside group of people at all. It came from the inside group of those reformers. When men, advancing in their knowledge and seeing more light and more light, as time went on, they saw the evils of human creeds, party creeds, and party names, and they made the plea finally that was right. They said, where the Bible speaks, let us speak, and where the Bible is silent, let us be silent. That was their plea. And we have it stated in New Testament words, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And the whole restoration concept is wrapped up in that statement. Where the Bible speaks, where the scriptures speak, let us speak. And where the scriptures are silent, let us be silent. All right, then, we have an emergence here from Reformation into a period of restoration. The plea was to get back beyond every reformer, get back beyond Wesley and Calvin and Luther and Wycliffe and Huss, and back beyond the formation of the papacy itself, back beyond the Dark Ages, back beyond that which preceded the Dark Ages, back beyond the worship of the emperor, when it was once said that to be a Christian one must be a Roman. And that period in history that's called the Holy Roman Empire, back of that, farther on and on, that was only a gradual development of apostasy that culminated in the Dark Ages. But now back beyond all of that, right back to the New Testament is what it means, where the Scriptures speak, let us speak, and where the Scriptures are silent, let us be silent. I'll certainly have to condense what I want to say on these points. But when it comes to identifying things, and people will say, out of all of this talk of restoration, how are you going to identify anything? How are you going to identify a restored church? Well, you know how to identify an automobile if it's lost and you want to find it. Talking about the church lost and found, what about an automobile lost and found? How would you go about finding a lost automobile? It would be by make, model, and number, wouldn't it? Well, we happen to have the make, the model, and the number of the New Testament church. And if it has been lost to anyone, it can be identified. But we have to go back to the New Testament to do it. We can't identify it through human documents and human creeds. There is only one book that identifies it, and that's the New Testament itself. And so first I'd say uh, the identifying mark should be origination. How does the church come into being? And that would be the word seed. You plant seed anywhere, and it produces after its kind. You don't have to have an unbroken chain of church succession dating back to the New Testament in order to have the New Testament church any more than you would have to have a wheat crop through all generations unbroken in order to have one now. Then origination means that every seed produces after its kind, and if you've got the seed, the wheat seed, you can plant it anywhere, and it will produce the same thing anywhere. Well, you can take the New Testament to any dark land of the earth today where the church has never been known and preach it, and it will produce now exactly what it produced then. That's origination, and the word seed expresses it. Just some words here now, just as hurriedly as I can give them to you, the next organization. And to express organization and how to identify the correct organization, we would simply have the word congregation not denominational machinery, not ecclesiastical bodies, but the congregation of Christians gathered together for the purposes of worship and service to God. The simplicity of it, elders, deacons, members, elders to oversee and provide the teaching of the truth, deacons to assist in service, members to assemble and work out their soul salvation, preachers to proclaim the word of God. Congregation is the word that identifies 
the organization of the New Testament church, and then the word doctrine. And beside that word doctrine, I'd simply say gospel, that it takes the same thing to make a Christian now that it took in New Testament times, and that there isn't any other way to do it. When Mark 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, when Acts 2, 38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and when it says, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and uh, were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls, and the last verse says, The Lord added to the church daily, that is, through that process, there was only one way to be added to the church in New Testament times, and that was to be baptized. There weren't any other kinds of addition. People might need restoration, they might need uh, correction, but there was only one way to be added to the church, and that was to be baptized into Christ and into the one body, and there isn't any other way to be added now. That's the doctrine, just in the word gospel. Then the word worship, we'd simply use the word pattern. Paul says, keep the ordinances as I have delivered them unto you. And whenever you add an element of worship, you have an addition. Sometimes people say, when is the thing an addition, and when is it not an addition? And one man said, show me the scripture for seats in the meeting house, or lights in the meeting house, and I'll show you one for organs in the meeting house. I told him it wasn't parallel, but I'd like to see him look for the organ, and I'd show him one for the seat. James, the second chapter in the first verse says, if a man comes into your assembly, you say unto him, Sit thou here. That's a seat. Can't sit without a seat. And it not only said seat, it showed him where it was and told him to sit on it. And so that chapter and verse. And then as to the lights, when Paul preached on the first day of the week in the 20th chapter of Acts and continued his discourse unto him at night, the record says there were many lights. So quibbles can be answered, but those are not parallels. A thing becomes an addition when another element is added. For instance, in the Lord's Supper, which we had this morning and which uh, table is spread here tonight, the elements specified are the bread and the fruit of the vine. Well, the plates on which you distribute the bread are not additions because no element is added. But if you sp spread butter and jelly on the bread, you've got an addition because there's another element. The vessels in which you distribute the fruit of the vine are not additions because no element is involved in the vessel. But if you put sweet milk in there or some other element than the fruit of the vine, well, you have an addition. Well, sometimes people say an instrument of music uh, is just as scriptural as a songbook. But a songbook does not uh, bring any additional element of music. When you use a songbook, or you just sing, whether you sing without looking at the musical staff or sing looking at it, you're just singing. There's no element involved in the songbook. But when you bring the instrumental music in, you have another element. That's where the addition takes place. That's the butter and the jelly on the bread. That's where the addition takes place. And the simple coordination of words and illustrations. We'll settle all quibbles like that. There's a pattern for worship, just like there's a pattern for doctrine, and we cannot exceed it or fall short of it. We can leave nothing out. We can add nothing to it. And so the word pattern expresses worship. Keep the ordinances of I've, as I've delivered them unto you. And then the word name, identifying the church by name. Well, we'd simply put the word Christian there. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Well, if the disciples were called Christians then, why shouldn't disciples be called Christians now? And so we're willing to call the people of God by any name or designation that the New Testament mentions, but none that it doesn't mention. Same thing with reference to the church. Willing to call it by any designation that the New Testament mentions, but none that it doesn't mention. And that's the question of name or nomenclature, we'd say. That is the terminology, Bible things by Bible names. And then, finally, the word creed, being scriptural in creed, and we simply put beside it the Bible. A human creed is a formulated interpretation of what the Bible says, 
the divine creed is what it says, and it's our only creed, and we can have no other. Now we have these six identifying things, origination, organization, doctrine, worship, name, and creed. And if we are right in origination, and right in organization, and right in doctrine, and right in worship, and right in name and right in creed, it couldn't be the wrong church. But if we're wrong in origination and wrong in organization, denominational ecclesiasticism, and wrong in doctrine, and wrong in worship, and wrong in name, and wrong in creed, then it couldn't be the right church. That represents the make, the model, and the number of things. And it's just a matter of identification, whether we have those things or whether we don't. And if we have them, it couldn't be the wrong church. If we don't have them, it couldn't be the right church. And so I'd like to close this lesson tonight with a little incident buried in some literature that I read somewhere sometime of a group of travelers back in the 49 who were trying to get across vast desert expanses to the Golden Coast and the land of gold in those days, the gold rush to California. They became separated from the main party and thought that they would perish for water, when all at once they came upon a sparkling, running stream of water, and they rushed to it with delight, thinking that their thirst would be satisfied. But when they drank of the water, it was brackish and bitter. They sat beside the stream in disappointment. One of their number wandered up the stream and came to the fountain from which the stream was flowing. And when he drank of the water of the fountain, it was sweet and refreshing. He wondered how a fountain so sweet could send forth water so bitter. It led him to examine the surroundings and away down below the fountain why he saw side streams pouring into the main stream. And that solved his problem. The side streams were bringing into that main stream the bitter and the brackish element. He went back to his party and took them up to the fountain. They drank and were satisfied. And I thought how aptly does that illustrate conditions in religion today. There are many men standing on the outside looking on, and they ask the question, what is Christianity? And when they see the discords and the dissensions that exist in the religious world, divisions over creeds, and everything else in the way of uh, the doctrines of men. They say, if that's Christianity, its waters are brackish and bitter. I have longed to go to those men, and I've gone to many of them, and to take them by the hand, and I've taken the hand of many of them, and have said, my friend, you're drinking too far below the fountain. Come and let's get back to the fountain. And the fountain is just this word that I've been reading to you tonight. The fountain is just the word of God, nothing else. This is the fountain of truth. And when we drink of it, its waters are sweet and refreshing. But away down below the fountain, men have poured into the stream of religion their speculative theologies, their religious errors, and their human traditions until they have corrupted the stream. And the outsider says it's brackish and it's bitter. The whole aim of the churches of Christ today should be, at least, and the aim of everyone else who loves the truth, to bring people back to its source, to its fountain, and let us drink of its waters. And that will lead us into obedience to God. It will lead us into his church. It will lead us in complete devotion in obedience to his will, doing all that he says, and only that, no more and no less. It will guide us along life's pathway until we've come to the journey's end. And that sort of faith and hope will transport us across the Jordan into the sweet land of Canaan, where we will enjoy forever, eternally, in an unending heaven, all the joys and the bliss that the God of our souls has provided for us. And if you will come here tonight, again I say, and stand with us on the Bible, and the Bible alone, which we've tried to emphasize in the two services of 
today in these related subjects. We want to extend the invitation to you just as fervently as we can. This is the favored time and the favored place for you to come, and we pray that you'll do it while we stand together and sing. One of these days it won't be long, Jesus will call his children home. Will you be ready for the great, wonderful, day? wonderful happy day? All of these things are first and right, meeting our Savior in the sky. Will you be ready for a great day? Wonderful day. 